The dream of the International Space Station is coming to an end. It's been a long road, one that involved unprecedented cooperation between the world's greatest superpowers. But was it all really done in the spirit of human exploration for science? There were more politics at play than NASA would ever lead you to believe, and the reasons why the ISS really came together the way it did might just surprise you. We're going to begin our story in the early 1980s. The only prerequisite information that you really need before we jump in would be that in the decade prior, the Soviet Union had been experimenting with a series of relatively small and primitive orbital space stations, while the USA had launched one relatively gigantic and highly advanced space station. Neither of the two approaches had been effective for establishing a long-term outpost above the Earth. The early 80s saw the entrance of a new major player into the space race, Europe. Members of the European Space Agency had demonstrated an early mastery in constructing and operating research satellites. They'd even designed and built their own small but capable orbital rocket, the Ariane 1, which first launched in 1979. For their next development, ESA had set their focus on a preliminary manned orbital space station. During this very same era, NASA had just finished dumping all of their available funding into the Space Shuttle Project, which took flight for the first time in 1981. Now people could launch to orbit in a fleet of reusable space planes, which was great except for one significant downside at the time, there wasn't very much for people to actually do when they arrived in outer space. But the Europeans had an answer, Space Lab. It was a reusable laboratory developed by ESA that would fit inside the cargo bay of the space shuttle. In many ways, this was the first international space station, and it added significantly more value to the shuttle program. Now people could fly to orbit and do experiments in the space lab, and the European hardware was versatile enough that it could be arranged in various configurations within the shuttle bay to meet different mission objectives and conduct a wide variety of orbital science. The pressurized space lab module was flown on 16 shuttle missions beginning in 1983, and this design was used right up until 1998 when orbital research was transferred over to the ISS. So that's a pretty cool bit of space history that doesn't get talked about very much. With the space shuttle program finally in motion, the United States joined the Europeans in the desire for a permanent outpost in low Earth orbit. This would become one of President Ronald Reagan's key marching orders during his State of the Union address in January of 1984. Reagan issued NASA the task of developing a permanently manned space station in cooperation with America's friends and allies that would be used for scientific and industrial research, and the manufacturing of new metals and medicines. Reagan's plan was to launch the station in the year 1992, the 500th anniversary of Christopher Columbus arriving in America. This is the first design concept from 1984, the Power Tower, a long vertical truss with solar panels near the top and a cluster of modules on the bottom. At the same time, ESA was deep into the planning of their own space station project, with Germany, Italy, and France taking the lead. France would develop a new high-powered launch vehicle, the Ariane 5, which would support Europe's own manned spaceplane, Hermes. Meanwhile, Germany and Italy concentrated on an orbital research laboratory, which would also just happen to be called Columbus. By 1985, the ESA Council of Ministers approved European participation in the American space station. The European contribution to the International Space Station would consist of one module, permanently connected to the core station, a free-flying laboratory, an unmanned polar research platform, and a data relay satellite. So at this point, things were really starting to shape up, and optimism was very high for the next generation of space exploration, until it wasn't. I want to share a bit of personal news with you here this week. I've finally found an AI assistant that I like. This is Perplexity, the world's first answer engine and it's my new favorite artificial intelligence-powered search tool. Not only can Perplexity answer any questions, it also provides a collection of relevant web pages and hyperlinks to sources within the response that show you exactly where the AI got its information from, 
which is something that no other AI tool can do. If that wasn't enough, Perplexity will also provide you with a collection of images and videos that are relevant to your prompt. It's like replacing three Google searches all in one. Perplexity searches the web in real time and finds the highest quality web pages for your question. Let's see if it knows what's happening with our old friend, the Boeing Starliner. And yep, it's got the most recent updates and news articles right here for us. How about the status of China's latest moon mission? Got that. We can get a list of all lunar missions scheduled for 2024, pull up more info on NASA's Viper rover, even check out what resources we hope to find on the moon when we get there. Click the perplexity link in the description below to see the answers and try this amazing tool for yourself. I really think you're going to like it. 1986 was a rough year. On January 28th, the space shuttle Challenger exploded in midair, killing seven people on board. The single greatest tragedy for human space exploration at the time, and it took the wind out of the sails for America's space program. This presented a major setback to space station development. Just one month later, the Soviet Union successfully launched the core module of their own new space station, Mir. This was unlike any of the previous Soviet efforts. Mir would be the first ever modular space station, and like so many times before in the space race, the Soviets had beaten the Americans to the punch. So the USA was on their heels. How could they make their comeback? Even with the shuttle fleet grounded, work continued on the International Space Station design, although it wasn't called that yet and wouldn't be for another decade to come. But international support for the project had already been secured from Europe, Canada, and Japan. This is what the space station concept had become in 1987. It's now a horizontal orientation, single truss design with a cluster of modules in the center and winged by solar panel arrays on either side. The scheduled launch date had now changed to 1994. There would be two American modules, one to serve as a crew habitat and one as a dedicated laboratory. The ESA Columbus module, a Japanese research module from JAXA, and a robotic arm system from the Canadians. And then in 1988, President Reagan gave the station a name, Freedom. So at the time, this was shaping up to become a tale of two space stations. The Soviets would have Mir and the Western superpowers would have Freedom. The message to the world was not subtle. Of course, Freedom always comes with a price. And in the case of this space station, that was right around $15 billion. In 1980s money, this did not go over well with the US Congress, and so began a war between NASA and the government, with the cost and timeline of the Freedom Station turning into a bloody battleground. Things did not go well for Freedom after three years of back and forth between NASA and Congress, multiple budget cuts, timeline changes, and station redesigns, they actually ended up with this ridiculous thing. It's a space shuttle orbiter that's been refitted into the core module of the Freedom Station. NASA would remove the wings, landing gear, and heat shield by stripping it down. The payload capacity of the shuttle would reach up to 37 metric tons, allowing for a 56-foot long pressurized module to be mounted into the cargo bay, along with four pairs of 120-foot long solar panel arrays that would roll out in space and then onto this would be added the European and Japanese modules. Everyone hated it. But something else happened in 1991 that would present a major new opportunity for space exploration. It's December 1991 and the Soviet Union is no more. The long-standing enemy of the Cold War has dissolved into a collection of independent nations now free from 70 years of Soviet rule. Russia hadn't really been Russian since the October Revolution of 1917. Could they become a new ally, or was this simply an old enemy in different clothes? Either way, one thing that Russia definitely had was one hell of a space station. By this time, Mir had grown to a four-module configuration. It had a dedicated astrophysics lab, X-ray telescope, ultraviolet telescope, and biotechnology experiment lab. It didn't take long for the US government and NASA to extend the olive branch of friendship and start making themselves at home on Mir. 
Now, this wasn't the first cooperation between the two powers in outer space. The Apollo-Soyuz mission of 1975 had been generally considered to be the end of the original space race. NASA's Apollo spacecraft performed a docking maneuver with the Soyuz capsule, and the two crews spent time together exploring each other's spaceships. The big takeaway here for NASA was that the Soviets were very far behind in the development of their aerospace technology. Soyuz was primitive compared to Apollo, which was already 10 years old at that point, and the Soviets were nowhere near what NASA was developing for the space shuttle, so it was generally considered that there would be nothing to gain in cooperating with the Russians, unless... There are two schools of thought when it comes to why the United States decided to make Russia a key partner in the space station project. This first one dives a bit into the realm of conspiracy theory, but it's not that outlandish. So we as Western people tend to celebrate the fall of the Soviet Union as a good thing, but for the people who were living in those former Soviet nations at the time, things were not so good. According to the official Russian economic statistics, the nation's GDP fell by roughly 50% from the year 1990 to 1995. This is a far greater decline than what the US experienced during the Great Depression. That was only 30% between 1929 and 1933. So the Russian economy was trashed. And one of the biggest victims of that decline was the Russian space program. Space exploration was kind of looked at like a symbol of the old Soviet empire, the Soviet ego that bankrupted the nation while the people starved. So all of these former Soviet rocket scientists and engineers suddenly had little to no funding from the new Russian government. They kept going to work, but only because this was their life's passion, they didn't know what else to do, but they might start getting ideas. This is where the US government began to see a massive threat to national security in the making. What would happen if these well-trained and experienced rocket scientists were lured in by an enemy nation? Iraq, Iran, Libya, North Korea, all of them eager to get their hands on a nuclear arsenal that could threaten the Western superpowers. The difference between an orbital rocket and an intercontinental ballistic missile is negligible. The Soviet's first rocket booster, which eventually became the Soyuz rocket, was originally designed as an ICBM, so any amount of Soviet rocket technology falling into the wrong hands would be an existential threat to the established world order. And this was not unfounded. Things got so bad at the Russian space program that employees were stealing food rations destined for the Mir station. They were selling off rocket parts from the space program inventory. In 1993, the US government invited Russia to become a full partner in the space station program, which had coincidentally been renamed from Freedom to International Space Station Alpha. The Alpha was dropped in 95, and as part of the deal, America would send hundreds of millions of dollars flowing into the Russian space program. Everyone would get paid, everyone would have job security, and no one needed to do something crazy like defect to Iran. Now, this didn't really change the fact that the Russian space program was still in absolute shambles. The quality and reliability of the Russian hardware was not considered to be very high. One of the Russian modules was just a recycled Soviet leftover from the mid-80s, and still it was not being delivered on time or on budget either. The cash flow from the US to fund Russian manufacturing ended up well over a billion dollars. So that's one way to look at it. Many people who lean into this line of thinking would consider the entire International Space Station to be nothing more than a welfare program in disguise to prop up the failing Russian space economy in America's desperate bid to save their own ass. And I don't think that's totally wrong. There is some merit. The second perspective would be more in line with everything that we talked about prior. The Americans had no chance of ever building a space station on their own. NASA just could not come together on a practical design that the US Congress was willing to properly fund. The Freedom Station had been found to be 23% overweight, way over budget, and too complicated to even assemble, while still providing 34% too little power to even be usable. Even after years of planning, the whole thing was a disaster. It was dead in the water, so why not bring the Russians into the deal? Clearly, they already know how to build a space station, it's literally up there, it works. If we just give them some financial help to build Mir 2, and we attach all of our stuff onto that, then we'd have a space station, and it would be far cheaper to build all of the necessary power, propulsion, and navigation systems in Russia than it would be to do the same in the USA. Basically, 
What it came down to was that both nations needed each other. Neither would be able to move forward on their own. It's not really clear if the Russians even wanted a new space station, but they definitely liked the money and the clout that came with it, so the deal was done. The first step of this new partnership was the Shuttle Mir program. This kicked off in 1995 with the addition of a new module to the existing space station. It was deployed by the Russians and would serve as a living quarters for American astronauts and provide space for NASA-sponsored experiments. This was quickly followed by a new docking module for Mir that was delivered by the space shuttle Atlantis and would allow the shuttle to dock with the station. During this time, the Americans were able to learn from the Russians' experience with long-duration spaceflight, NASA was able to get a feel for how the station operated, the challenges and solutions, the American partnership ended up extending the lifespan of Mir from its original 5-year intention to 15 years in space. The orbital construction of the ISS began in 1988, six years behind Reagan's original goal and four years behind the revised freedom date that's actually pretty good as far as space timelines go. The first module to go up was a Russian contribution, Zarya, responsible for the power and propulsion of the station which was joined by NASA's Unity module, which forms a link between the Russian side and the American side. Unity is where the entire crew of the station eat their meals together. And the third module deployed was Zvezda. This was originally built in the Soviet Union in 1985 as part of the original Mir program. It provides life support to the entire space station and is home to the Russian crew. With these three pieces in place, the ISS was now habitable. The first resident crew, Expedition 1, arrived in November 2000, launched from a Russian spaceport. There were two Russian crew members and one American. And I'm sure at this point everyone knows the rest of the story. What became of the ISS, what became of the relationship between Russia and America, Russia and most of the Western world. It didn't work out so great, but none of what we know today could have possibly existed without that original cooperation between two great powers old enemies can become powerful allies it's happened so many times in the past and it can happen again that's what i've come to appreciate the iss is not without flaws but regardless it's still a pretty special example of what can happen when people work together <laughs>